That a girl. Ooh, ooh, pissed off. No! Oh, into the tree. Come around the rock. Up and around. Talk back, talk back. Bring him over. That's why it's always good to start with the small presentation first, and then work up to the bigger ones. They catch the big fish. Welcome back to another Addicted Fishing video. Today, there's gonna be a good one. If you wanna learn how to catch some steelhead, if you wanna see some steelhead caught, stick around. We got a perfect day, perfect day for catching winter steelhead. We're gonna talk all about how to do it and hopefully find ourselves a few to take home. Stick around everybody, this is gonna be a great episode. Let's do it. All right, everybody. We're gonna start off today with a worm. And I'm gonna talk you through a lot of today of, of process of fishing and fishing the right water with the right kind of gear. Why I'm starting the day with the worm, even though it's a pretty big an aggressive presentation is the kind of hole that I'm fishing. This isn't what I would call bead water. It's kind of spinner water, but this is the perfect spot for a, a bobber and a jig or a bobber and a worm. So that's what I'm gonna go with first. I'm gonna use the technique that fishes best in the water in those places, and that's gonna bring me more success. So setup I got today, Guide Select Pro 99, six to 12. I like the six to 12, because it's a little more flexy, and it's very exciting to fight these big fish in the fast water with this lighter rod this time of year. I got my Addicted Enforcer Braid. This is a 65 pound. I use this because it's just like a fly line. C40 Kymar. I got a bumper of 15 pound down to my half ounce float. After the half ounce float, I got just four split shots pinched on the line, a barrel swivel with some 12 pound test down to my Addicted Worm Black Jig Head. Sloppy Smith's the pattern we're going with today. And like I always say, if you can stink it, stink it. The scents that we make, you guys, the Addicted Winter Chrome Blend, and some of the Procure Anise is some of the biggest advantages you can give yourself out on the river. I just go a little bit right on the back of that worm and we're ready to fish. And remember everybody, only fish this scent in places it's applicable. If you're in Washington State and on a no bait river, it's illegal to use scent. In Oregon, you can use scent just about everywhere. But check your local regulations before you go fishing. So, let's set our bobber stops. I know I got about three to four feet deep out there. I'm gonna start a little bit shallower than normal. Only about a foot above my bobber stop. Let's go fishing. So my first cast I'm gonna make is just to the deepest part of the run. It's really sandy and it's kind of shallow on this in close, so I'm casting just off of the ledge from where I can actually see the bottom. A lot of times these fish will sit a lot closer to the bank than people give them credit for. So you wanna start close, go to the middle cast, and then cast far. What makes a good hole for fishing a jig or a worm is the speed and the depth of the run. You don't want anything with any broken water on the surface or that moves too fast. As you can see this hole in front of me, we got boulders all the way through it. It's not something that I could drift the bottom. It wouldn't be very easy to drag a bead through here because it would keep getting snagged. So this is a just over walking speed current. Anywhere from slower than walking speed to just like a fast walking speed like we have here is perfect for fishing a worm like this. And especially if it's at four to six feet deep. Any deeper than that, you're gonna have to add a little more weight, maybe go to a quarter ounce jig head so that you can get down and past all that current. But anything from four to eight feet deep is the perfect bobber run for using a worm or a jig in this situation. Okay, you guys can see as this clip goes on further, I end up farther and farther down on the tail. I'm gonna preach it only a few times today. Close, middle, far, two steps. Close, middle, far, two steps. Doesn't matter what method you're using, you wanna work through the hole. It's not efficient to stand at one part of the hole and let your stuff drift all the way to the end. We call it hero drift. Nobody needs to be a hero out here. Use your feet or use your boat to move down the run, work it cleanly, work it efficiently, and then move on to the next spot. So, let me go over quickly, guys, what a worm box should look like. And mine doesn't really look like the way it should, but that's just a sign of the times and the sign of the season because we've been fishing a lot. So what I like to do, you know, all these different addicted worms come in different packs. I usually don't like to mix them quite as strong with opposite colors because you'll see these things actually bleed together. But I just take a few out of each pack and put them in here. I got the old school. I got some of the old school pink. I got a lot of our three inch 
our new three inch addicted worms, these things, especially with the water dropping right now, low and clear water is gonna work really, really good. I'm excited that we came out with these finally in, in all the addicted worm colors. So we have pink haze, we got red haze, we got it all. So I go with some of the classics. I got my sloppy smiths in here. I got some of my pink haze. I got some of the old Miss Americas in the three inch. But the thing is that you can see here is I have a variety to match watercolors and conditions as the day changes. And also I have different sizes of worms in here so that I can try to attract a bite and especially in high pressure situations. So that's a worm box. Quick little tip for you guys. Throw them in a little box, pack them to the river. That way you don't have a mess of bags in your bag. Okay, back to the wormhole number two. This one here, again, you can see has that nice moving current. It's about walking speed, only about three feet deep. So this is a same, this is a hole that I would go with a bead, a spinner, or a worm. Something that's actually moving quickly, but I'm gonna stick with the worm because I have confidence in it today. And one nice thing about fishing with worms and jigs is with that fixed hook, and especially with these addicted mustad jig heads, they have a longer hook shank so that that hook actually sticks farther back in the worm, whereas a normal one only goes to about right here, probably to where our, our hook point starts. So there's probably a whole nother inch of length of hook to hook that fish with, which helps a lot. So usually when you hook a fish on the worms or jigs, you don't lose them. So it's a good one to start with. Okay, I have exhausted my worm. Time to go to the bead. What I have here, I'm going a little fancier with this setup and a longer rod is required for the bead setup. I have a 10-6 X rod. This is an eight to 15 pound rod. Really great for fighting these big steelhead. This is an Epixir E40, same 40 series reel. I like that reel because it has more line that can be put on it. 65 pound braid, bumper down to my float. Half ounce float again. A little Dave's Tangle Free on a three-way swivel. About four feet a liter with a split shot in between and a pink bead. So, and again, one thing guys that you guys can pick up on our website are these bead hooks the Advantage bead hook, and they are an advantage. I'm gonna talk a lot about the proper way to set a hook with a bead today, and hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate it so you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about, about less is more. You don't wanna set the hook too hard, but these beads really hold on to these fish. That's the biggest pain in the butt sometimes with beads is you lose a lot of the fish. So we add a little glass bead in between here. This is a Cameron trick, tied into the line with our Advantage bead hook, size two just below it, and it's been working really well for me. So let's get the fish in the bead. One thing that seems very apparent with bead fishing is that you always want to fish faster moving water. Things that are too slow are going to allow that bead to get down too close to the bottom that either the hook will snag up or that split shot that I have rigged on my line will snag up as well. So fishing moving water like this is key sometimes to making sure that you're fishing the right spot with the bead. Okay, so one crucial thing that I'll talk to you guys about today is how you give line with the bead. Mending and line management is very, very key when fishing the bead. I like to always keep my rod at a 45 degree angle. These things are 10 feet long so that you can use them. Holding your rod tip like this does nothing for the success of catching a fish. All it does is allows there to be way too much line on the water and it ultimately drags your bobber down river too fast. So I wanna have my rod tip up like this the whole time, about three quarters of my line off the water, leaving a quarter of it on the water so that that bobber can actually use that line as momentum to pull it down through the snags and through the rocks. So that is the biggest key today that I'll tell you guys. The, no, the other one is to manage your line properly with your hands. Don't grab up here, don't hold the line any other way, but just putting your hand on the bale so that your hand's close to that bale. That, so when that bobber does go down, when the fish takes it under, all I have to do is close the bale, grab my handle and start reeling. No hook set, no yanking, just a straight reel to that fish until you feel it come tight. Okay, everybody, you know, this is what we call a fish anything kind of hole. We have a beautiful, beautiful run below us. It's about five to six feet deep, steady current all the way through. This can fish a bead, this can fish a jig, worm. You could probably drift fish a spot like this, but let's try to get a fish on the line and quit talking. Gotta get a worm fish, gotta get a worm fish. Really want a worm fish, worm fish. Set your bobber stop about two and a half feet and another foot deep. Yep, step on down there a little further so you can cast better. And just a nice little flip, just the other side of that foam. Beautiful. 
Yeah, and it's gonna go down as soon as it settles down there in that tail out. It'll get nice and slow. It's all them big bowlers, be ready. Ooh, dirty. Oh, okay, really right. And kind of point your tip to the left a little bit, if you can, if it's not in those trees, and just try to slowly reel back up so that you don't spook the fish at all. And in a real glassy tail out like that, guys, where it's nice, smooth water, it's only about four feet deep, it's imperative on those first couple casts, if you don't get a bite, to reel back slowly so you don't splash, you don't drag that bobber down underwater and make it do like the, the plug move, which will ultimately scare the fish sitting in those tail outs. So be nice and gentle, bring it back out of the strike zone, and then you can rip it back in after that. Very nice. All right, everyone, another perfect jig hole. Time to get a worm back in here. You can see again, I got big boulder, something spot where I really can't touch the bottom. That's why I'm gonna go with the jig here. This wouldn't really suit a bead. The bead can't work around those boulders the way this worm can. So let's see if magic will happen. There he is. Oh my God. Whew. Now, difference in between this and the bead, you saw how I got real Yankee poo with that one. Not always the best, but doesn't hurt as much as you, it will if you're fishing a bead. The jig is one of the only things, jig and the worm is one of the only things that you can actually set really hard a hook on, enjoy it, have your fun with it, get your frustrations out. But it bit me in the butt that time. That was definitely a bite kind of caught me off guard a little. That a girl. That a girl. Got him to bite twice. <laughs> Clean it up behind me, guys. Now we did that one in opposite this time. We did the worm first, got bit. You guys saw that. Brooke came in behind me, just lost the fish on the first cast. Second cast, fish on. Woo! <laughs> Yeah, she's here, straight up in the air, straight up in the air. Ooh, who pissed off, he's mad. Oh, into the tree. Dang it. That was a big fish, too. That's the old middle fin right there. Son of a gun. Whew. Well, it was worth the workout. Process worked again. All right, baby, here you go. Go fish the pink bead. So everybody, couple key things to bead fishing. The things are, is having a good bead box. A lot of people talk about my favorite bead, my favorite bead, oh this bead does better on this river, this bead does better on this river. And honestly, I gotta say for the most part, it's because it's actually true. More than any other lure presentation, more than any other kind of setup, it depends on the size and the color of the bead that you have to how successful you're gonna be fishing those beads. You need to have a bead box that has a good range of colors, a good range of sizes. You need to have up to your 16s to 20 mils and all the way down to your 10s and, and eight mils. A lot of times it really will help you be more effective when you're traveling different rivers especially. But once you find that bead that works for you, keep that thing in your pocket and always take it with you and have confidence in your bead. That is really the biggest part of bead fishing is one, having confidence in your setup and two, having confidence in the bead color that you've chosen. Beautiful. After that cast, make maybe one, two more in close. And then uh, let's walk down to the tail out. Okay, next part of the tutorial, how to stay fed on the river. Today, I have one of my favorite recipes. Great way to stay warm, great way to stay happy and keep the girlfriend happy too. We got to cut to spicy ramen. Yummy, yummy in my tummy, as well as a little bit of my homemade canned fish. Already snacked them a bit, you guys missed that part, but we had to stay, had to stay full of nutrients while we're out here. So let's get this thing started. Mmm. 
Canned fish is an absolutely amazing way to preserve your fish throughout the year, guys. It's better than just smoking it and then putting it in the freezer. Highly recommend it if you have some fish in the freezer because they guarantee you, if you throw some stuff this fall by January, it's starting to get a little freezer burnt. So do what you can to make the best of your fish. Don't let that stuff go to waste. So we're definitely gonna make the most of these fish we got here today. Fish on! Got a girl! Got a girl! Brooks just got one while eating lunch. Let me get her soup ready and we'll go net the fish. Good job, good job, out of the rock. Tip up, come around the rock. Up and around. Talk back, talk back. Bring him over. Nice. Good job, baby. <laughs> Let the line out. That's a huge one. <laughs> yeah, baby. Woo. Lunch is ready. Woo. Look at that. That's what we came for. Holy smokes, look at that girl's fish. That's how we get her done. That advantage bead hook all the way in the mouth. Look at that. Look at how that thing was hooked, everybody. The way we shape that hook really, really helps get that thing in there. It doesn't have the bend in the eye, so the hook doesn't sit cocked while it's fishing. It sits straight out. You can see I just tied a normal fisherman's knot, and that thing was not coming off. Look at that. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Thanks. So you guys, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of persistence, and hard fishing, and you can catch the fish of your dreams just like Brooke just did. Yep, just like that. Okay, that's better. There it is, yeah. Got a big old scar on that side too. Right there. So as you guys can see, using that systematic nature of the beast, Starting with a bead, I was just up there cooking lunch. Brooke walked down, started fishing the hole, started it with a bead, then we'd go to the worm, then we'd go to the spinners or something a little more aggressive. Paid off this time. And who knows, we might get another one by switching to another different kind of presentation too. So that's why it's always good to start with the small presentation first, and then work up to the bigger ones. Because it catches big fish. Here you go. You gotta keep your nutrients up. Fighting all these big fish there, honey. Canned salmon, ramen. Thank you. Well, I only brought one fork, naturally. <laughs> Enjoy my life. Yum. You like that with the fish? Yeah. It's a nice fishy flavor. Cheers. All right, everybody. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for. Spinner talk. The setup I'm going with for the spinner here. And you guys, there's a different tutorial style of video that we just did recently, a few weeks back. And that tutorial really covers a lot of the jigs and the bead style of fishing and worm style of fishing today. It's obviously a little bit different. We're kind of covering different tactics. So go back, check some of those old videos out or go into the tutorial section in the YouTube channel here on Addictive Fishing. And you can see tutorials of all kinds of all different methods. So, but what we're doing today, we got our spinner, we got our X rod. This is the 932, eight to 15 pound, perfect perfect rod. This is a 9.3 and I like any rod that's above about eight and a half feet for the spinners. You can use shorter rods for faster moving smaller rivers. For bigger water you want something a little bit longer but you don't want anything too long over 10 feet. For my spinner choice I got an R&B on here. Spinners are very important to the style that you're fishing to the different waters. It's good to have a good range of colors, a good range of sizes, and a good range of types of spinners. And that being the torpedo bodies, the bell bodies, and then the weighted spinners, the big heavy ones that get down in the fast water. So with all that being said, let's step in the water. Let's talk some of the techniques. So spinners, you guys, are incredibly versatile. The thing is, when you walk up to a hole and you see it's about three to five feet deep, perfect walking speed like you see out here in front of us, the same depth across most of the entire hole, that's when you know you got a perfect spinner spot. So, after you've identified that the hole's a good one for using a spinner, you wanna start using the process to break down this hole like a, like a pie chart, almost. You wanna go close, first cast gonna be about 50 feet out there. I'm gonna swing that across, I got my tip low, pointed right at the spinner the whole time, and I'm only reeling enough to make sure that blade's spinning. It's not just a straight reel back in. They're not trout, they don't wanna chase the spinner, they wanna be attracted to it by hitting them in the face, or AE lack thereof being attracted to it. It pisses them off. It's gonna come floating down, it's gonna get in their mouth, and they're gonna to try to hit it just to get it out of the way a lot of the times. So that first cast was close, second cast is gonna be a little bit further. Again, tip pointed right at my spinner, and I'm gonna control my depth with my spinner tip. 
or with my rod tip. If I want to go up to the surface, I, I raise my rod tip. If I want it to go down to the bottom, I point it down towards the bottom. And I still keep that line tight the whole time. Once I feel bottom, I can reel it back up and recast again. So that's my second cast to the middle. Third cast is going to be far. I'm going to throw it all the way over there, keep my tip pointed right at the spinner, following it down river the whole time. You don't want to keep it in the same spot and let your line swing. You want to follow your spinner with the rod tip and almost lead it a little bit. That way you're getting that spinner down in the face of those fish and it will create a nice level swing so that you're not snagging up all the time. One thing I'll show you guys you can definitely see is a big part of how I fish spinners is that I change every single one of my spinners to a 2 aught must-add side wash. And that's this little guy right here. That's a must-add hook. It's a 2 aught side wash and it's perfect size for the steelhead in the wintertime. And the shape of this thing is an absolute killer. It's unbelievable how well these hooks will hook these fish. So with all that being said, I made my close middle far cast. I'm going to take two big boy steps down river or I'm going to pull my anchor up and I'm going to float down a little bit and I'm going to cast again. First one of the close. Second one to the middle. And the third one to the far. And then repeat. <laughs> and one last thing I can say is extremely important about my setup. I have the C40 Kaimar on here and I have a 30 pound test. That 30 pound enforcer braid is honestly the best thing I can find in the world for fishing spinners. And that's not just a hopeless sales pitch. This line cuts through the water so much better than a heavier braid and it's very smooth. So you can see how easy this thing casts all the way across the river. I just flick my tip and with that rod, see it's all the way across in one just effortless little swing. And it's unbelievable how sensitive this X-Rod is for this, this 9.3 in particular. They make this in a bait casting and in a spinning. Both work really good for throwing hardware like this. But having that high vis enforcer braid is probably the most important part of this. You can see that I've tied a bumper onto the end of my line. I got about 10 foot of bumper so that the fish aren't seeing that extremely high vis line. That's about 10, 12 feet of 15 pound test tied directly to my spinner. But it's the way that you can see that line and fish the different structure that you have in front of you using that enforcer braid is what makes it such a good advantage. You know, I can see my line and exactly where it's at, exactly where my, fish, or my spinner is fishing as it's going through the strike zone, which is very rare. You don't want a dark colored line or a brown line of any sort because you're not going to be able to see it blending in with the water and the structure down below your line. You want that high vis line so that you can tell where your spinner is at. Ooh, I feel like I'm gonna get one in this tail out there. I do, I do. Give it scabba! Imminent bug! Imminent bug! Come on! big one <laughs> you didn't do nothing wrong so everybody what you saw there was a fish pulling a trick on us Brooke did everything right as I was talking about earlier with fishing the beads the hook set is less is more she did everything perfect because the river is flowing so hard through this section as soon as she closed the bail on that fish that fish took off and got hooked unfortunately it threw a couple big head shakes did a 360 and it spat the hook but let that be said, less is more on the hook set. You'll lose a lot less fish on the bead if you don't set the hook. So, darn it. He'll bite again. There'll be two of them. Here he is! Got him! Got him again! What? Hold on a second. <laughs> well, something to be said about cleaning up with a spinner. Brooke, unfortunately, missed two strikes on this fish. The fish spat the hook each time. She was consistently yelling at me to get out of her fishing hole. 
And I really, it was on accident I caught this one. I wasn't, it was an accident, I promise everybody. I did not, I high hold my girlfriend. At least I didn't low hold her. A lot of force on this fish right now. It just goes to show you guys how using multiple methods on a biting fish, a fish that's aggressive and ready to eat, using multiple methods, not leaving that fish because you didn't eat your beat again, can be very important. I went up through here, made three casts with the spinner, and got the fish that we'd already caught before. Yeah, he's way down there still. I don't... It's a big one. Show you guys, I'm in fast water, I got a big fish. And you can see, since I've started this fight, my tip has not moved from right on the water surface. I wanna keep this fish as close to the bottom of the river, even though it's shallow as I possibly can. That way he's not gonna to wanna to run down river any further. You can actually get a belly made in between the line and the river to where that fish starts to feel like he's being pulled from behind, which will ultimately make him swim up river. I haven't moved him an inch. The fish is drawing blood. We got blood dripping out of the hands. True warrior status. Come on, buddy. Come on. Ah. I'll bring him to you. Back end of the net a little lower. There you go. A little higher, there we go, just like that. Okay, now just close it. Good job, baby. Woohoo! Yeah, baby, nice net job. Wowzers, McNowsers. That is a steelhead. That is a hatchery steelhead right there. Oh, baby. Product of a brood stock program right there, everybody. If you want good fishing on your rivers, promote brood stock, talk about it, share it with your friends, share it with people on the river, because this is what comes back when you brood stock fish. Wow. The addicted landing net worked perfectly. I don't know if you guys have seen these yet. Look out, little. These are our new addicted landing nets made by Mustad. New cotton-free mesh, so it doesn't hurt the scales of the fish, especially if we're catching and releasing wilds. You got your measuring tape on the inside now, so you can see exactly how big your catch is, no lying. Let's see, what's this one at? Wow, only 29 inches. And you guys saw that fight. Woo! Sorry, baby. <laughs> there it is. Tip to the left. <laughs> Ripped the rod. Ripped it out of your hand, didn't it? All right, if this isn't obvious enough, Brooke took the spinner, went back through there, and got fish number two. And it's way bigger than mine. We got him right where we want him, too. This is going good. Oh, stop that. Stop that. Stop that. He's huge. Yeah. See, what happens is he gets to that shallow edge. He doesn't want to go any further, so he stops. So he's going to keep doing that until we get him tired enough. Yeah, and once he's got it, exactly, just like you're doing, once he gives up, just straight reel on him. There he is, right there. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep him low, keep him low. Straight up in the air. Straight up in the air. Nope, never mind. Oh, he's trying to kill me. He tried to kill me. Okay, straight up. Keep going, keep going. Roll him over. Nope. He tried to kill me again. Can't be trusted. That's perfect, though. We just got to wear him out. If you start to get him on his belly, take an extra reel and keep lifting so he flips over backwards. So guys, to land a fish in this landing net, it has to be upriver of the lander, or of the netsman. So she's getting it upriver, upriver, upriver. Now she's gonna pull it to the surface and right at the net. One straight up, back towards me. Got it! <laughs> yeah! And it's another hatchery. We got her boyfriend. Wow. Little, get out of there. Look at that thing. Chunk a monka. Well done, baby. Thanks. I'm a spinner. <laughs> Woo! So it goes to show to be versatile, you guys. We've been using three to four different methods at every single one of these holes. And at the end of the day, the spinner paid off. Okay, here comes the truth. I could just tell by trying to hold this fish's tail that this one is definitely bigger than the one I just landed. Oh yeah, by three inches. 32 inches, 31 and three quarters. Nice fish. Woo!
Well, everybody, I hope this video today helped you maybe learn a few things or at least got you amped to go out and chase some winter steelhead this year. Almost all the products that you saw us catch fish on here today can be found at addicted.fishing on our website. So check this stuff out if you need some tackle, if you need some gear, it's all there for you as long as some cool swag. If you guys want to see some more cool videos just like this one, go up here and click this link to this next video. Go down here, hit subscribe, turn those bells on, give this video a thumbs up and comment below to give you the comment of the day just like this guy right here. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. You all stay fishy. We'll see you out there.